in Oscar Wilde when he was in, when he was ended up his life and uh, exiled in Paris. He said, "Je dois parler de rien sur le seul domaine où je devais connaissance." I, I love to talk about nothing. It's the only area where I have a bit of understanding. Yeah, that's me. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you're looking at my Facebook Live feed and or YouTube or other sites that this podcast is on and or the podcast itself in conversation with Frank Schaefer. And today I'm talking with Christian Erickson, who is an author, and he has written a book called French Kissing in an American Cult, which I like. I was just digging back into the first chapter again, Christian. I think you're the only person who's ever opened a book with a paragraph about French kissing the pastor's wife while sitting in church. And um, we've got to unfold this at the beginning and then talk <laughs> about the book. So now you describe yourself as a gay idealist who stumbles and then falls into the hell of Pentecostal, the Pentecostal mega church. I don't even know where to start. Um, were you raised in some sort of a fundamentalist or evangelical background or did you come to this late in life? No, I was raised as an atheist or a, not an atheist, but as an, as an agnostic. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I, I, I lived in the Pacific Northwest in the mountains and all my relatives were pioneers from the times of the gold rushes, uh, from the times of the migration to the Puget Sound country and then the gold rushes in Alaska. I, I lived in this idyllic, idyllic environment. And what did they do? What were your parents doing where you were raised? Um, my, my, father, my father was a, uh, a salesman, uh, I mean, uh, uh, for diamonds. And my mom uh, got tired of bridge, so she ran a, a, an antique shop. Uh, uh, I called her a junkie. I said, my dad deals ice and my mom is a junkie. Uh, pretty awful to say about your lovely parents. My parents were just about perfect. And they, uh, they supported me and my two brothers. They just, and, and, uh, and how old were your siblings older than you or younger than you? I'm sorry, say that again. Older siblings or younger siblings? I, I was in the middle. I okay. am in the middle. I am in the middle. And um, no, but the idyllic upbringing and the, uh, I mean, nobody, 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 but nobody in the family was Christian. Mm. Uh, well, except for me, that's my name, but that's a joke. No, yeah. uh, <laughs> he, uh, so my, um, my, my parents were just about ideal. And, and as, as a young boy, I just was interested in men and boys, other uh, men. But mm -hmm. that, wasn't, that wasn't hardly a factor because the thing that I was most interested in was simply being in nature, loving mountains, loving uh, catching frogs, uh, loving chasing dragonflies, just anything in nature. And also, you now this sounds pretty uh, uh, precocious for a little kid. I was very interested in philosophy. Mm. I would philosophize to my friends. And then also I talked to them about geopolitics. But the thing is, I was, I was, I was labeled a dumb kid because of course I was dyslexic. And that's, that was not some of the concept then. In my, in my childhood, nobody could be dyslexic. I was mm. just a dumb kid that had a hard time learning to read. But, and so in my childhood, I, I, I didn't consider myself to be smart or exceptional or anything like that. Yeah. I, consider, I considered myself to be dumb. But the thing was, the only people that interested me were those people who were smart. Mm. And so I accompanied with only with smart people, but I thought I was a dumb kid. But um, and so that's how I grew up and my parents, uh, you know, they knew that I had trouble learning. So they, especially my mother, were very, very supportive. They were very, very helpful to me. Mm. And, and so, I mean, I just had, uh, I mean, as far as an ideal family. Now, uh, I certainly, certainly my mother must have thought I was, I was gay because I wasn't interested in girls. Did she, did she, she ever talk to you about that or did that ever come up? Or was no, 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 because they were always incredibly supportive. Mm. And, and so, for example, 
uh, it was very, very difficult for me to just learn my time times tables in arithmetic. So my mom, after dinner, she put aside the, the, the table and, and, and set up things in a piece of paper and she drew me on time tables. Mm -hmm. I'm still I'm still not very good at it. Uh, and so uh, but I mean just about the ideal type of parents who um, and then all of the relatives, the relatives, uh, my mom's side of the family is, is the Longmire family. Now for people who've ever been to Mount Rainier National Park, the park headquarters are in Longmire. Yeah. And and the uh, the the uh, the visitor center is at Paradise, and that's my what my great great grandmother named that. And other other places in the in, in the national park are relatives. They're relatives that uh, I so, but that's how I grew up. And again, about sexuality, that was hardly an issue. Yeah. Until until in uh, in high school. I, I, I had this longing to uh, the, the beauty of nature, the aesthetics uh, of, of Mount Rainier, uh, you know, which my great uncle was the first, uh, uh, was the first mountain guide on Mount Rainier. And, and so, but the beauty of it all, I just, I had this longing inside where I had to say thank you to somebody about this beauty. And so this longing inside. Now, that, even though I, I mean, in high school, I was a pretty diligent uh, atheist and environmentalist. Mm -hmm. And I, I tried to, uh, I spent a lot of time trying to convince my, my uh, fellow students that Christianity was stupid. And, uh, and, and I, I remember like this one instance, for example, my, uh, my, 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 um, my grandfather died. And my, my aunt was trying to comfort me about this. Mm -hmm. And I think I was, I was, I mean, I'm not sure, I, maybe 12 years old. And she said to me, oh, you know, he's in heaven now. And I said, no, heaven is a concept that's manufactured by people mm -hmm. to try to make themselves, and the whole concept of God is to try to make people be moral. And so uh, I know, I remember this because she talked to my mom about this later, and I and I, I didn't think. I mean, all I did was just stating the obvious. But she, um, she, um, so she talked to uh, my mom about this, and, and but it's true. I mean, I felt this was true, and, and so. Um, but then in high school, I, I had a teacher that um, I, I valued greatly. And so he, quote, led me to Christ, which mm. was... Now what, that, 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 were you a senior at that point? I was, um, uh, at that year, I think I was a, I was a, a sophomore. In so high let school. me ask you a question. Between the distance between being led to Christ by your teacher and the first incidents in French kissing in an American cult, which is your book, where you talk about uh, French kissing the pastor's wife while sitting in church, how old were you when that happened? Okay, so high school, you're converted. How old are you when you're ki kissing the pastor's wife in church? And by the way, from the way you've written it, you're you're not pressing yourself on her. She's she's very happy to do this. Exactly. Okay, exactly. so what's the, just give me just, without going into details. We're going to get into the details, but what's the time frame? You're in high school and you accept Jesus. How long between then and French kissing the pastor's wife while sitting in church? Roughly 12 years. Okay, so so give me a sketch um, of the 12 years from, from quote-unquote getting saved to this particular mega church, which, by the way, I won't name unless you want to. Uh, it doesn't, it, it certainly doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, but it, and was it, what part of the country was it in? It was in Seattle. Okay, so how did you go from accepting Jesus as your personal savior in high school to French kissing the pastor's wife in the, in, in the church. Tell me, give me a sketch of those intervening years and how involved you got in the church. I think you were very involved there. Mm -hmm. um, very. Were gonna I was, a, I, you, I was you, you not, were an ordained I, deacon or something. I was an ordained elder. I was the director of communications. I was young. the only, only, only person, only person in the church who had a direct ring down line to the pastor I characterize myself, and this is a, not too much of an 
uh, exaggeration. I yeah. characterize myself as Goebbels to a little Hitler. Yeah, and I'm, so w- did he know, Did it th- when you came into the church, did he know you were gay? No, I didn't know myself I was gay. Okay, so admit. when, when okay, so I've got to add something to this timeline. It's getting very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> French, we're going to bookend accepting Jesus and French kissing the pastor's wife. And now I'm going to ask you, in that timeline of the 12-year period, somewhere in there, were you also having gay sexual experiences, or was this after you kissed the pastor's wife that you came out to yourself oh, oh, and to others? Oh, okay, let me clarify. Let me clarify. The, I mean, um, we're doing a sort of a Fifty Shades of Grey Jesus thing here, okay? So yeah. let's just mm-hmm. go with this, because it's, it's, yeah. Bingo, it's bingo. Be- for, first, let me explain that first chapter of the book is jumping to the very end, right before the collapse of this cult, yeah. this mega cult. And that is, it was in the, the total uh, obscene uh, decline of the cult. Because this and was so a that, church that fell apart, right? Yeah, it, it lasted for 25 years. And I was there from the beginning. So, but let me, let me just hit the high points. So I was in high school, a very good high school, had very excellent teachers. Yeah. And they, they believed in me and I did very well. I mean, at first I was just a dum-dum, but yeah. then I started to blossom forth and I had very good teachers and very good support. I did all sorts of things. I was in uh, organizations for human rights. Uh, I was a page in the in the, in the or a Washington State House in Olympia. Mm-hmm. I I um I was in the honor society, and I uh, I started I started with German in high school. Okay, so now and let I, me interrupt you a second. In in terms of earning a living, what sort of a job were you on a trajectory to do? Having graduated high school, you were doing all these extracurricular things. How did you intend on earning your living? What sort of job were you headed for? <laughs> At first, I was going to study theology, uh, uh, theology in German at Pacific Lutheran University, which is okay. where I, I matriculated. Yeah. I was going to I was going to study at, at PLU, and I did, and I, I spent my junior year at the University of Freiburg in Breisgau, and then also later, just I mean these things all jump into there. I was also at the University of Geneva in French. Um, I, in Switzerland, I, on my old Swi- stomping grounds. Yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. And what were you studying in Geneva? Uh, that was just uh, just uh, French language improvement. Okay. Courses. Now the problem with this interview is you're too interesting. There's too much going on here. I mean, you've thrown in Geneva, which of course now immediately has my attention because it's Switzerland where I grew up. You're doing theology, which has my attention because that's my family background. Anybody that opens a book with a French kissing scene with the pastor's wife is my friend automatically because <laughs> you drew me in right away. Uh, and uh, so there's too much going on here. We've got to make sense of it. And then we need to get into this sort of, um, you know, 50 shades of whatever it is you've, you've done here and talk about this church, how it fell apart, the kind of Hitler, Hitlerian authoritarianism of the pastor, you playing Goebbels to him and what you did. Unpack that in any order, but make sense of it for us now, because there's too, I, I, I've done a very bad interview so far. There's way too much on the table here, and I don't know how to unpack this. There's too many threads. And you're exactly on it. You're exactly right. Other times when people have talked to me or when I've written about it, they've said, there is just too much going on in your life. Yeah. What is, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, just for fun, for example, later, just for fun, I I became an EMT, uh, an emergency medical technician, primarily to help me with mountaineering. That's also a very interesting side note. But no, let me... That's uh, your next book. How long were you an EMT for? uh, I was just, well, active for just a few years. Yeah, but that's enough to have gathered some stories. So you've got another book there, but Uh, you'll have to to start that one with, you know, packing people out of car wrecks, and then we'll go to the French kissing later, but let's get back to the story here on this church. Okay, I'm going to start with something specific. Why was the wife of the pastor French kissing you? Did she do that? Did she make out with all sorts of people? Did you start this? Did she start this? Let's just start with that scene. I want to know what happened that day. Okay, in order to talk about that, I have to say, remember, this was at the end of the cult because it started out as Pentecostal holiness Bible study and a home fellowship. And it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew and it transmogrified. Now- At the height, how many people were going to this church? 
at the high point about 3,000. Okay, so there's 3,000 people uh, going when this thing has grown into a mega church, and somewhere on that path, um, you have this incident with the wife. Okay, you wanna you wanna paint the picture for us and, and give some details, but I, I want the scene. No, okay, what I'm gonna say doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make sense, but I'll say it as it is, as it happened. Okay, through the progression of this, see the Pentecostal church has had this idea. We have yeah. this idea that things are getting better and better. It's a, yes. it's a Hegelian philosophy yeah. that, uh, that things are, must get better. They must get better step by step. You don't just exist. You have to get better. So that doctrine led to uh, certain perversions that, uh, in retrospect, are perversions. But you had to uh, had to uh, expect that there was going to be a quote fresh new wave of the spirit coming always new things new revelations. Yes. So at the towards the end of this, first of all, there came this movement called deliverance in the church, where uh, they were focused on casting out demons and things, which uh, and the doctrine started to go through that. Then who who are the national leaders of that movement that my audience may have heard of? Um, I mean, um, it can't be just your pastor. I'm not asking for names, but there were national leaders. Like my movement, the national leaders were Dr. Billy Graham and, and evangelists like that. And my father was sort of in those footsteps. Who were the national leaders of the movement you were in? You know, the, um, the names, I don't know the names, but in general, you call it the latter rain Pentecostal movement, which was big in, uh, in central uh, Western United States and also in, in, uh, in, in, in central Canada. Yeah. yeah, but um, latter rain, latter rain preaching, latter rain, and again the whole thing about the latter rain, and I'm expecting the latter rain to be coming. To, this is what's going to be the um, the where where we're going to be going. But right. here, let me let me jump forward to the improbable. Now, when you say I'm trying to make, when you say making sense of this, you have to understand that after I was out. I saw a psychiatrist for almost 10 years. He became a good friend, just yeah. trying to make sense of what I'd been through. He treated me more for me for PS, PTSD. Uh, and then that, but okay, getting up to the, uh, the beginning, which is the beginning of the end of the whole collapse of the church. See, we believed uh, that Jesus was going to come and manifest himself through other people. Mm -hmm. and, and this is going to be called spiritual connections. And so we weren't going to just greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, we were going to go farther. Now, the things in my book that are terrible are the things I could write about by other people if I didn't want to get sued. They're, uh, they're far worse than what I know, what I was involved in, but I tell my story, my participation yeah. in this. So here it was. Uh, now, the pastor and his wife, have a terrible marriage. Of course, they didn't. They, they represented it. It was wonderful. But he had uh, sexual deviance. I mean, I'm jumping ahead. And he, um, in the end, he was, he was all for all sorts of other people, women that he called connections. And he was arrested uh, in Las Vegas for exposing themselves to hotel maids. And this was just you know impossible absolutely impossible in in the mindset that we were in because we were in this holiness mindset and he was found when, out and, got, and tossed and that's when it fell apart no it, 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 the amazing thing it was able to to it, keep himself from being found out because the the complicitors the uh, enablers in the church hid everything from the congregation mm -hmm. they didn't even know that this happened because there were all of these enablers but no, getting forward, uh, talking to them. So, so when you hear the Jerry Falwell Jr. pool boy story, this rings very familiar to you and all that. It is, it is, it is more familiar than you can possibly imagine. Yeah, it's, par, it's yeah. actually par for the course. It's the usual. It is, it, it, it is not the least bit unusual. It is yeah. normal. It is absolutely normal. And I, I've had enough experience, especially in my role as the director of communications, kind of had communication with all sorts of other Pentecostal and, and evangelical churches mm. to see how wormy 
the whole system was. Well, and anybody who has experience, you know, I knew Richard and Patty Roberts at the Oral Roberts University, and that ended in scandal and destruction and criminality and all sorts of stuff. Anybody who's been close to any of the big Pentecostal ministries and known the leaders personally, I, in fact, I can't think of one where some aspect of what you're talking about is not the case. Okay, but let me so, let so me let's just you. let's just let's just ask a little parenthetical question here, and don't go into anything else for a minute. Give me a theory as to why the Pentecostal movement has an angle on sexual deviance in the true sense of the word deviant. I believe all sexuality is normal, as you perfectly well know. You know, when that word is used by evangelicals, it means anybody outside of heterosexual normative relationships. That's not my view. When I talk about deviant, I'm talking about deviating hypocritically from the standard they set. So, you know, nobody's gay, nobody's unfaithful, nobody's trans. They all are. They pretend they're not. The deviance is in the hypocrisy. I just want to be very clear about that. And the lies <laughs> told to bolster a totally false system. That said, can you give me your thumbnail sketch and hypothesis on why that whole movement is so tainted top to bottom with a bunch of fraudulent, hypocritical, you know, sexual predator liars? I mean, that's the only way to put it when you look at the whole American uh, movement in, in that part of the church. What's the deal? Because they're the worst of the worst. They make the Roman Catholic look like altar boys, no pun intended. <laughs> exactly. Uh First of all, eyes from your own experience. Uh, first of all, the um, the Pentecostal churches mm -hmm. they uh, they tend to attract people that have problems, uh, you know, because people are looking for solutions. Yeah, and and sexual deviancy, and sexual repression. See, uh, that that's what is attractive to people. Mm -hmm. Now they come in and they they suppress it. An analogy I like to use is, uh, you know, if you're in a swimming pool, you can you can hold underwater, you can hold three beach balls underwater and nobody ever, did. but it doesn't work for very long. Eventually one pops up and yes. people will see it. And eventually, see, you get tired of this. You just let them all pop up. You say beach balls are the way we live. And, and so uh, that's, a, that's a poor analogy, but it fits, it fits. What I saw was beyond awful, and I was the editor, I was not just the director of communications, I was the lead editor of the publications department. We had about, at the high point, we had 30 employees, approximately 30 employees. And, uh, and, and, and the total employees in the church were about 300 at, one, at the high point. But the things just got sicker and sicker and sicker. And I re one of the series that I edited was called Strengthening the Marriage. And the marriages went all to hell everywhere. Uh, divorce was the watchword within the church. Divorce uh, and even every, every sin of the Catholic church that we've ever decried. Now, I, I know of rumors of, of murders, I, I, I know, but I don't know them specifically. I do know of the one woman I mentioned in the book, this wonderful woman who was otherwise wonderful, who, who killed her baby, who killed her baby. Uh, but that's that's a little bit different. That's a different subject. But no, on his sexual deviance, see the suppression of it. Eventually, those beach balls just pop up and you have now, to. Now, let me just stop you there for a second. What part were you playing in the suppression of things you knew to be true? When did when when did you move from sort of this idealistic approach to an insider with your own level of hypocrisy, knowing what was going on? And yet you're part of you're still part of the system being good faithful servant of this pastor deliberately helping him suppress things that were true and or outright lying i mean when when did that balance tip when did you know what you were doing okay graduation my senior year at, at pacific Lutheran university i was getting ready to go to graduate school yeah and i i, I had this i had this uh equivocating idea that I could be a theologian and I could also understand these Pentecostals and I could be in both systems at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it came down to New Year's Eve. Uh, I stayed on campus because I had a thesis to write. So mm -hmm. I stayed on campus with a bunch of other, with about eight other, uh, eight other seniors who had similar things. So I, I didn't go home for Christmas, I stayed on campus. Now we had this 
fantastic New Year's Eve party. I got champagne from my parents. Mm -hmm. And so we all got totally drunk. And in that party, in that party, I, I got, well, plastered. And then my roommate, I ended up having a sexual relationship with him. And I was so horrified about it. He, he was so gone. He couldn't even yeah. remember what happened. I could remember it in detail. And I go, and then the morning, on the morning of, of New Year's morning, I go, okay, a Christian, if you think this way, if your system is so good, why were you doing this? And so, I know it's, it, 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 and, and I understand that it's really nothing that it's not that big, but for me, it was a major crisis. Sure. So I announced to the people that were part of this Pentecostal group, I just go, I'm, I'm a part of you. I'm, I'm just two of my brain. And the fact that I could do this is, is in retrospect, how the frick could I even do that? But I did it. I just went, bam, and I was gone. Yeah. And so I threw in with these people. I was there for almost 25 years. Hmm. And so because I, they needed me, uh, they needed me in that group because they needed uh, my talents. Hmm. I became a leader. And, uh, but uh, the pastor had this sort of dual relationship with me because yeah. he was jealous of my abilities and language, my abilities and English, my abilities. But he needed me. So I was his ghostwriter. Hmm. And so he depended on me. But no, but moving forward to the very, very end, I started to get to this, this doctrine uh, of, of, of spiritual connections where another person represents Jesus. Well, since you love Jesus, then you love the other person. And you started, you started, uh, and started out with kissing. It started out with um, um, kissing and, and then uh, and impossibly. Uh, then, of course, kissing moves to French kissing. Kissing moves to uh, getting naked. Kissing moves to all sorts of things. Now, uh, the pastor, he recognized that I was a homosexual, even though he would never say it. Yeah. But since I was esteemed in the church, since I was a leader, he would preach from the, uh, from the pulpit because people were starting to criticize him for his excesses and what he did. So he said from the pulpit, now, consider Christian Erickson. Now, obviously, he has spiritual connections with, with men. And so, since that obviously can't be sexual, then you, you need to attribute to me as your pastor that my relationships aren't sexual either. How crazy can this be? Yeah. How absolutely nuts. Yeah. But we believed it. Now, here, let me, uh, so here to the context of the French kissing. Now, in the Christian school building, in the largest Christian school building, because the, the church became very, very large mm. and had a Christian school with 600 students. And, and, but the building there, uh, what was supposed to be the cafeteria, was, it's, it, it, was it was labeled on the, on, the, on the diagrams E250, so educational building 250. Mm -hmm. So that room became a designated Were, weren't, you kiss, weren't you fresh kissing in a room labeled E10 or E110 or something like that? I'm sorry? In the book, don't you label the room you're in with the pastor's wife E110 or something like e, that? E, e, it's E250. Okay, uh, 250. E, I had the number e, wrong, but I knew. No, it no, no, it's okay. And you're, if you're dyslexic like me, you're going to get the numbers hey, wrong. I, I remembered it was a number. That was good for me. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Uh, we're, we're on common ground with this part. No, yes. but uh, so anyway, uh, this room was only, it was only the people who were in the know could be admitted to it. And, and, and eventually there are membership cards to get into the past to E250 because you had to have a mega spiritual connection. And that was one that was just, you know, knock your socks off. So basically, this would, they, if you could make it into that room, it was open season. You could sort of have your little spiritual connection orgies in there. Bingo, bingo. But we, of course, we didn't call it that. Now, and, and so let me describe the room. The room is about 200 feet long uh, and sort of rectangular. And around, there are pews around the edge of the room. And, and there are music. There's music piped in from the, 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 the sound control systems in the sanctuary. Yeah. All sorts of after, this is after service, after the main service, when people who had the rights to get in there could be in there. And so on the floor, there were people 
who were uh, nestled among, with one another kissing. And, and there were other people that were sitting there. Now, the, the, the wife of Pastor Barbara, she was like the queen bee of everything. She was the one that she she defined she defined the uh, she defined the um, the uh, uh, sort of the the uh, the daily uh, knowing how to be connected to another person. Yeah. So no. Uh, so I was I, I went into this room after church one Sunday evening, and I was sitting on the side, and she came down and sat next to me. And so we began to kiss. And that was not at least a bit unusual. That was because, of course, see, she's trying to find Jesus in me. But that's not what's really going on, in my opinion. So she's yeah. trying to find Jesus in me. So we start the French kiss. And two thoughts are in my mind. First of all, I've been French kissing with all sorts of other guys in this church. And so I go, could grief, she's not as good as these other guys. That wasn't a thought in my mind. And of course, that's too unholy to even articulate. Yeah. But then she, um, she, uh, it only took a short time before a you know, little tongue dance and the and the kissing ended, and she pulled out, and and she, um, she, I mean, I'm good grief. I'm going to just tell it as it is, as I yeah. think about it. Okay, so she pulls out, and she opens her eyes and says. Oh, Christian, it's you. I go, and I go, what bullshit is this? What bullshit is this? Yeah, who'd she think it was? Oh, you know, who is it? And she thinks I'm going to be Jesus or something. Yeah. But see, in the back of my mind. Now, later, when I had the psychiatrist helping me uh, come back into normalcy, uh, after that time, see, I, uh, he characterized, he said, you're not, you're not uh, bipolar, you're not schizophrenic. However, your behavior in this time was like it was that, it was similar to that. Because see, in the back of my mind, I had this feeling, this understanding of what was wrong and what was right. But, and so like at that moment, like when she pulled out, see the, the little, the actual Christian Eric's in the back of my mind is going, this is absolute bullshit. And so, so anyway, but let me uh, let me turn the page here a second. Just mention to everyone, you're listening to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, which is a podcast, Facebook Live. It's on YouTube and other places. I'm talking with Christian Erickson today, who's an author of a book called French Kissing in an American Cult. It's a well-written, entertaining book. And also, I guess, of all the exposés I've seen about what you might call the lunatic fringe of the lunatic fringe, um, is is really the uh, you know I guess the most revealing you know I, I want to broaden this out a little minute here from your perspective on this Pentecostal movement to just note that white evangelical Christians elected Donald Trump and they are his most faithful supporters but within that circle of support his most faithful backers are people like Paula White and others of this Pentecostal evangelical. Uh, movement, and they are also the backbone of QAnon. They are the backbone of the vaccine rejection movement. They are the backbone of the conspiracy theories. They are the backbone of those who believe the election was stolen, that the Biden's not president, that God is going to restore Trump. And what I try to explain to some of my secular friends who have no experience of this is, first of all, when you listen to someone like Christian Erickson talking about his experience in this Pentecostal church, a, this is not unusual in the same way that when you <clears throat> listen to someone raised in a Roman Catholic church and they talk about having been raped by a priest or a bishop, that is not unusual. Um, in lots of parts of the world, that is the norm within Roman Catholicism. And in the Pentecostal church, you have two things going on. You have all the sexual deviation and hypocrisy and the weirdness. One of the nation's most famous Pentecostal leaders, his son's wife and he were having a falling out. And one time she was supposed to come to La Brie Fellowship to straighten their marriage out. He didn't come with her. And the next thing she did is call me, say, I'm at the Dorchester Hotel in London, and here's my room number. I've always liked you. This is like maybe 40 years ago. So I've had my own experience with some weird moments that got intensely personal 
with people in the charismatic Pentecostal movement. There always seems to be a strange sexual edge to any dealing with these guys. Um, so what I'm getting to is this. Let's change here a minute into a wider picture and talk about why it is that the base of the base of the base of Donald Trump's support is all drawn from white American Pentecostal Christianity. What is it about white American Pentecostal Christianity that makes it even more subject to conspiracy theories, to weird things like QAnon, to all the ideas about the stolen election, and now has turned into an anti-democracy movement where they don't even want to accept election results. And all of a sudden, it's not funny anymore. This isn't Christian Erickson French kissing in a, in a church with a pastor's wife, and we can all be titillated by this. These people are in control of the Republican Party. I just want to let that sink in. The folks that Christian is describing are now in control of the Republican Party. They are exactly. driving the agenda. And exactly. these are exactly. Yeah. So talk about that. Let's go there and let's spend the rest of this time together talking about what it is that makes white Pentecostal Christianity a threat to our democracy. First of all, the type of person like you mentioned, like Paula White. Right. She is common garden variety, familiar, that type of personality. Now, uh, in the as far as explaining why. I can't explain why. I can explain what happened. I can tell what happened. Now, in this church, was just impossible. Well, she's been sued multiple times over financial misdealings and all the rest of it with, by her own people. No, the no. real question is, why does anybody follow a, a self-evident con artist? Well, uh, why, why are there snake oil salesmen? Why is this? Why is it the people... Of the appeal of it. Why is that? I don't know what the answer is. But I, I, what I, I'm looking for is why, I mean, evangelical Christianity in general is to the right, and it's racist often, and it's white nationalist, and they started all these segregated schools. But the Pentecostal movement has a spin to it, which has turned particularly deadly. And I'm, and this I'm is fishing exact. for that. And let's, listen, I don't have the answer. This is not a rhetorical question. I'm asking you, Christian Erickson, who had this narrow escape, which could have ended in suicide from what I gather from your book. And, and uh, it didn't, the sort of PTSD, here you are, you had your counseling, you had your help, you're still here, you're writing about it, but you're an insider insider. I want you to riff a little bit. You can just think as broadly as you want to, but what is it about the Pentecostal movement that does this? Well, first of all, it's obviously the first thing is the adul adulation of the leader, the uh, devotion, the Hitler-like devotion to the leader. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the first thing. Now, when, for example, a community chapel and Bible training center, that's the name of the group. It doesn't exist anymore. But when that collapsed and he collapsed and infamy, infamy, then the people uh, about of the three, uh, let's say, let's use the number 3,000. Uh, 3,000 people went, um, now approximately 1,000 people just disappeared. Another uh, approximately 1,000 people went into some type of more mainstream Christianity. You find them in Episcopal churches, you find them in Lutheran churches, you find them in Methodist churches. Now, but the other 1,000, the remainder, I call them Community Chapel 2.0, because they're just, now, they have guns, they love Trump, you cannot talk against Trump, they're anti-vaxxers, they're everything in this agenda. Now, the only thing that I can identify is what I observed, and that was when their leader was taken out of their, their hands, they, they, they turned for something else, uh, sort of a golden calf, like uh, uh, and Donald Trump, he fit the role of it. Because, of course, they gave them what they wanted, just like Hitler gave the people of Germany what he wanted. And other, other similar leaders throughout history gave the people what they want. So this is what, uh, this is, I mean, it, but it's not a reason. It's not a, it does, it, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. And when I've talked to these people, when I've talked to them, uh, I mean, they, they completely despise me. You know, the fact, for example, I, it was never supposed to be ever, ever told to anybody about E-250 and what happened in that room. Nobody was ever supposed to say anything. And so they're mad at me uh, if they even uh, know. But they're, um, they're um, how, why it happened. 
uh, I mean, all I can say is it's some fundamental problem in, in the nature of a person where uh, um, I, I'm, could read. I mean, I don't know. I do know, uh, like um, Thomas Aquinas talks about how uh, it's impossible to know. Uh, uh, well, you, uh, there are good people in the world, but, but according to Thomas Aquinas, however, with evil people, there's always some good. There's always some appeal that they, and that's the reason that people are drawn to them. And and like you know, in Germany with uh, with Hitler, and I know this subject well because I'm I'm, I'm, I'm a, somewhat of an authority on it. But in Hitler, with in Germany, uh, the the people were were drawn to him. And and the the thing that in the United States, most people think that the church was not supporting Hitler. The church was Hitler's enabler. Uh, people like Goebbels, they they philosophized and gave him the groundwork to draw in all the other people to the place where theologians and, and where they talked about and, and bishops in the in the in the Evangelische Kirche in Germany, they they said that Hitler had a place higher than Jesus to be worshipped, and this is the exactly. What has happened in this church? I mean, this is a little microcosm of that. Uh, the people, the, uh, the community chapel 2.0, they felt exactly the same way about Donald Trump before the election. You were evil. You were deceived if you didn't vote for Trump. And they still, and like this former uh, former minister there, he told me that it's logical that we have guns. And I go, you're crazy. You're crazy. How can this be logical? So, mm -hmm. I haven't, but. Uh, why it happens. I mean, I don't have a good answer for why. It's just a phenomenon. It seems to me that evangelical Christianity in general, in fact, religion in general, always gravitates towards personality cult because it's, it isn't just one big church. It's all these little churches. And so in a way, to even be an evangelical Christian in any church, even if it doesn't have a sexually deviant pastor or a French kissing pastor's wife to be facetious and also truthful for a minute, nevertheless, the, the form of evangelicalism is always personality cult. The great hero emerges, whether it's my dad, Francis Schaeffer, or Dwight L. Moody, or Billy Graham, or Franklin Graham Jr., or Jerry Falwell Jr. There's always, you know, Ralph Reed. There's always this great leader, because first of all, there's not a hierarchical structure of a pope or bishops or anything like that that is kind of a given. So it always is the personality cult. It's the rock star. Then if the rock star turns out to be a, a jerk and a liar and a fraudster on top of it, or goes into it because of that, it goes a step further. And then you have the corruption of the money because there's there's huge money in the God business. But, but after you do all that, at least within more mainstream evangelicalism, while the theology is insane, uh, taken at face value, it doesn't glorify the experience of the cult in the way that Pentecostal Christians do. They go to another step where irrationality is part of the theology, whether it's the speaking in tongues or the claims of healing and so on. So they're already in an area, in a place where if you're not into some sort of experiential lifestyle that is, quote, denied by the world, uh, if you're not already denying everything the world teaches as science and the rest of it as somehow uh, fake news, as it were, to borrow Donald Trump's thing, you're suspect. You've got to be other, you know, and that's why the homeschool movement and Christian school movement thrives. You know, then you go to the step of your church and it's the next sta stage out and becomes a cult, sort of within a cult. All I'm saying is the mindset for decades has been ready to receive a Donald Trump because he, rather than being the anomaly, he's exactly like their own leaders in both temperament aims, manner of operating, even, even the molesting of women and his own, uh, you know, multiple marriages and all the rest of it. I mean, you know, when people came to me and said, how can evangelicals vote for this guy? I said, hey, he's exactly like their pastors. Uh, you know, what do you think the evangelical churches are like with scandal after scandal, scandal after scandal, scandal after scandal, children being molested, exactly the same sort of rates you see within the Roman Catholic Church. You know, there's nothing that Donald Trump did that is any different than, you know, all these other guys, Jimmy Swagger, every single scandal you can think of, years yeah. and years and years of scandal. It's the unusual figure like my father, Francis Schaefer, that wasn't mired in sexual or financial scandal, which I will say for my dad, he never was. He was an honest person. 
And there are those, there are those. Now, the pastor of this Jewish Don, he, uh, he had, from what I know, and I only know part of it, he had at least 30 different women. He had, uh, he had some, he got pregnant. And, and that's when his teaching in the church changed from, uh, to say that abortion is okay. Yeah. Because, of course, it, everything was about him. Uh, that, that was his nature. Now, um, uh, um, but why, why these, why the people do this? Um, I have no answer for that. Uh, well, uh, I mean, it's I don't, like I don't, saying, well, why did Hitler rise in Germany or Mussolini in, in, in Italy or, you know, the French collaborate with the Germans in France? I mean, there's no an big answer to that. I just think what has to be pounded home to people who come from a more secular background who never have experienced what you've experienced is, is how dangerous these groups are, because it's one thing to have a lunatic fringe. It's another thing when they control one of the two major political parties in our country. And right now, the lunatic fringe of evangelicalism like Paula White, if you look at those pictures of Donald Trump in the Oval Office and who is around him laying hands on him, as the basis of those who have now rejected the result of a legitimate election, it was the stars of Pentecostal evangelical Christianity. That's who it was. And exactly. So people should pay attention because, yes, your story is sort of scandalous and out there, but unfortunately... It describes a reality about the underbelly of the inner circle of the evangelical community that is accepted as legitimate by other evangelicals. If you go to Christianity Today magazine, they'll have articles about Pentecostal leaders. Nobody's talking about them in these terms. They're not telling the truth about them. They're paper papering over the truth of these little cults, which are all these little local churches. Let, let me tell you just one thing very quickly. Uh, in my book, I talk about a man called past Pastor Hans, Hans Peter Schneider, who was a pastor in East Germany. He uh, he was a voice of reason when I was going to study theology, and uh, I knew his his wife and his family, and he helped me, and he I uh, bonded with him when I was in my twenties. And, and all the time that I was in this organization, it was, he was a voice of reason in the back of my mind. And, and so he helped me to get out of it. Now, just, just last month in September, I, I, I found his widow and his family in, in Berlin to go back and say how, how this man had helped me so much. Mm -hmm. And now the reason I mentioned this is Doris, his wife, who's been an, a Lutheran for her entire life, a, a very nice woman, a very, very good and yeah. faithful Lutheran. She, she goes, I can't understand how Christian, how you could do this. You studied at university, you had theology background, you had ideals. How could you possibly do this? I don't know if I could, I can forgive you. Hmm. And then, uh, and then, and she said, on top of it, you know, being gay is not a big deal. But why, if you were gay, did you marry a woman? and know you're going to break her heart some days. I don't know if I can forgive you for that. Mm. And, and, then, and so I, I asked her, I said, well, if God can forgive me, can you? And she, uh, she's very witty. She said, well, you have to remember I'm not God after all. Yeah. Oh, and then I've got to tell something really funny. Now, I have MS, which is under control by injections. It, it's been manifesting for almost 30 years. Sure. I do very well with it. Now, I was explaining to her in a conversation uh, it was a wonderful time in Berlin with her and her kids. It's just incredibly wonderful. Uh, such a sweet reunion, such a bit of sort of emotional healing for me. Now, uh, so, but this joke is irrelevant, but it's funny. It shows her personality. She says, uh, I said, you know, a, a neurologist explained to me, said it's like you're a BMW that you can only put one liter of gas in the tank. And she goes, Christian, that's silly. That's silly. BMWs are electric. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are going electric. Hey, so when when you met this wise man, and what was his name again? Who kind of helped uh, you out? Uh, his name was uh, he was Father in German, Pastor Hans Peter Schneider in East Berlin. Yeah, okay. he was and a pastor. East Berlin before the wall came down and all that. Oh stuff. yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was able. 
I was able to use my American passport to get over the wall. And, and one time, it even uh, and uh, they took my passport away and they strip searched me because they thought I was up to something because I kept going over the wall again and again. But uh, no, he was such an incredible, wise, helpful person in my life. And so uh, also his socialism was ideal uh, and so, but I, I, I bonded with now, he, he died in 2009. L- looking but, back at what he, he represents, you know, kind of coming to the present, would you consider yourself a Christian today in the sense that he was a Christian or have you moved to a different position? I don't want to pin you down. I describe myself as- No, a, no, no, it's fine. See, your God. book, your book, I love it. I love the title of your book, Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God. Yeah. Uh, I go, that is perfect. That is a designation of me. Now, I, I, I have all sorts of reasons, all sorts of uh, studies and things now that would make me be an atheist, but I'm not. Uh, I, maybe it's like Soren Kierkegaard's leap of faith. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I didn't grow up. It's not that it's from my childhood or something. It's simply that there's something beyond me. So yes, I say I'm a Christian. I'm saying I'm a Christian. Hmm. But as far as I certainly don't have an agenda to proselytize, that's for sure. Yeah. Because I go, uh, I go in Oscar Wilde when he was in, when he was ended up his life and uh, exiled in Paris. He said, "Je dois parler de rien sur le seul domaine où je devais connaissance." I, I love to talk about nothing. It's the only area where I have a bit of understanding. Yeah. That's me. Yeah, and it, you mentioned the book, Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God. And of course, that was in answer to some of my friends in the New Atheist Movement who sang, who'd read my memoir, Crazy for God, saying, well, then why aren't you one of us now? You know, you still talk about praying and so forth. And it was interesting because one of the answers I gave those guys and I talk about in the book is exactly what you talked about earlier today in our conversation. And that was the beauty of the experience of life around us and nature in particular leaves you wanting to thank somebody which isn't proof of anything. That's not an apologetic for the existence of God. It's just a sense that, you know, prayer makes sense even when you believe it's probably not being heard because offering up thanks for what's around you is a kind of an instinct, I think, of anybody who's got their eyes open. I mean, you you know, if you could simply go through all this and never offer thanks to anyone, exactly, you have a, you have a problem. Um, let me remind people who are listening to this podcast and or watching that your book is French Kissing in an American Cult. It's a highly entertaining book, an upsetting book, an interesting book, um, because Christian Erickson writes well. Christian, just on a very personal note, how, how's the trajectory of your MS coming along? You're one of many friends of mine who has experienced MS. Where are you at now with your illness? Um. <clears throat> I, I take Latimer acetate injections, uh, brand name Copaxone. Now, yeah. statistically, statistically, only 25% of the people in the, respond optimally to that. Mm. I do. Now, I'm getting older, and so my balance is getting worse, but I'm way, way better. I mean, right. if I didn't have these injections, I might be blind, I might be in a wheelchair, yeah. but I respond optimally to it, and I'm very, very happy. And so uh, I, I just, I mean... So, you know, it, uh, in the book of hesitations, it says, uh, hesitations 316, of course, you know, that's a joke. Yeah. Uh, it says, you, you play the li- a game of life with the hand you're dealt. Mm. And so I, I just do what I, I have to do. Yes. Now, so it's okay. It's okay. I'm happy. Now, I've read your book, Fall in Love, Have Children, Say Put. I'm, I'm, and I go, this, in my view, is the most important work you've ever written. Thank and you. so I, uh, it is uh, uh, just, I mean, it's a summation of everything. And I go, and I have, I have found myself taking parts of your book and making them into my viewpoints, just as examples, living, living this story. I cannot overemphasize how important your book is. Mm, I really appreciate that. You're very kind to say that. And I'll mention that we have links um, for people who listen to this podcast or watch it. We have links to your book on our show page so that they will be able to buy your book easily. I would urge them to do so. I want to mention I'm also participating in a porch course with Gareth Higgins, my friend who founded the 
uh, Wild Goose Festival. It'll be coming, uh, we're doing a course together on my book, Fall in Love, Have Children, uh, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. And that book comes out November 2nd, if anybody wants to be kind enough to pre-order it and help me along a little bit to spread the word. Um, and I want to mention on the porch course with Gareth, nobody will turn, be turned away who can't pay the fee. I think it's $49. But if you just write and say, I don't have the money, then we'll, we'll welcome you anyway. So it's not about the money. Um, please visit porchcourses.com to become part of this course. And then please, again, as I said, uh, I would really appreciate anybody pre-ordering my new book, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy, out November 2nd. And one of the first things I say in that book, as you well know, Christian, is that it's not just about falling in love, romantic love, it's falling in love with connections with other people and putting that ahead of career. It's not having children only in the sense of having kids and grandkids, which I do have, but doing what we're doing here, where we're, as it were, nurturing and mothering each other. Um, I'm helping you get the word out on your book. You're uh, helping me explore my background through comparing it to yours. This too is a relationship of nurture. Stay put is smart to do. If we move 11 times in our lives, which is the American average, always chasing money and a bigger career, and then wake up one morning and say, we're lonely, we don't know anybody near us, um, you know, duh, someone should have explained that to you. And then save the planet, of course, is a paramount concern. So I do hope people uh, sign up for the porch course, and I hope they buy your book, and I hope they uh, pre-order mine. And I just want to remind them all that author Christian Erickson is someone who has had an incredible life. You'll find his book, French Kissing in an American Cult, um, what I'll call darkly entertaining in, uh, in, in a way that Spinal Tap is a darkly entertaining film about the rock and roll business from the inside. <laughs> There's a weird Absolutely. comparison, but this is Spinal Tap and French Kissing in an American Cult. If you like Spinal Tap, you're gonna like this book. How, how's that for a plug? Uh, you know, I've not read Spinal Tap. I don't even know. I'm uh, not it's, a, it's, a, it's a document. It's a rockumentary. It's a feature film that masquerading as a documentary, but it has an offbeat sense of humor about something imploding, in this case, a rock band, and in your case, a church. But, um, you know, there are parts of your book that are kind of what I would call bitterly funny, which from someone from my background, um, it, it strikes it strikes a chord, and I think it will to a lot of other people, too. Well, exactly. Uh, I'm... I'm I'm a comic. Uh, I'm I don't intend to be a comic, but it just happens. Yeah. My son, my son is a stand-up comedian, uh, and he's and fall um, far from the tree because the opening of your book is one of the funnier openings of any book I've read. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, intentionally so, very well crafted, but at the same time, uh, really made me laugh. It's rare you laugh right away when you start a book, and yours did. So thank you. Yeah, and in the introduction, I say that people would get so upset from making fun of these things, but they're, they're inherently funny. Like, you know, when the pastor steps, steps up and he talks about how Rasu is so evil, they go, that's Jean-Jacques Rousseau. What are you talking about? He knows nothing about what he's talking about. And other people just, it's uh, one after another, after another, as far as the humorous examples, I only just touch on some of them. Skim the surface. So, well, you know, that's good because you need to do another book. Uh, Take us I to will. the next stage of life and, and, and so forth and so on. Well, anyway, we're wrapping this up now. And Christian, I thank you so much for taking the time today. I hope I brought some people to your book. We are yeah. going to link to your book page. I do hope you read uh, Christian's book. Um, and once again, it's French Kissing in an American Cult. It is well worth reading. And if you're out there and don't know much about the evangelical slash Pentecostal movement, and you want to know who the heartbeat of the heartbeat of the heartbeat of the Republican Party is, it's these guys, and they it, are nuts. So and, let and, and that warn is you. absolutely true. What you just said is absolutely true. These lunatics are the heartbeat of the current Republican Party. Yeah. And on that on that uh, note, Christian, I will leave you and stay well. Stay in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much, lot, Christian. OK, take care. Thank, thank you so much. much for your time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.